Let's do a quick introduction to queuing theory. Uh, first question is, what is queuing theory? Well, a queue, Q-U-E-U-E, -U -E, is a line of people or things waiting to be served by some customer service agents or processed by a machine or something. Uh, so queuing theory is mathematical ways of predicting how long the line will be or how long the wait will be on average, or deciding on how many servers to have to keep the line length or the wait length as below some cutoff that we set. set. Uh, how do you spell queuing? Queuing uh, could have an E before the ING or not. Uh, Microsoft prefers it as Q-U-E-U-I-N-G in their spell checker. I prefer Q-U-E-U-E-I-N-G because then it's the only English word that I know with five vowels in a row and you just don't want to give up something cool like that, right? So before we go on, take a sec to think about what are some possible application fields of queuing theory? What things in life involve queuing? Maybe pause the video while you think of that. Well, here's my list. Uh, telephone call centers, factories where parts are moving around and waiting to get processed, inventory in a warehouse, uh, healthcare, waiting to get an appointment, uh, waiting once you're at the doctor's office uh, for the people ahead of you to be done. Um, anything with public safety, like firefighters or ambulances, hopefully you don't have to wait too long. Uh, repair technicians um, coming around to fix things. Um, car and truck traffic on the freeways. Uh, internet data traffic. UPS and FedEx waiting for your packages to get here. Uh, machines waiting for repair. Uh, queuing happens in restaurants. Um, so all kinds of fun stuff. Um, one uh, one thing that's interesting to think about in particular is air travel. Just take a sec to think about air travel. What cues do you encounter in air travel? Well, here's my list. First, you wait to find a parking space at the airport, or you call for a taxi, wait on hold, and then wait for a taxi. You wait for the parking shuttle from the uh, from the parking lot to the terminal. You wait to check your bags. You wait to go through security. You wait to buy some food. You wait to, for your plane to arrive. You wait to board the plane. You wait for the luggage to finish loading once you're on the plane. Uh, if you're in cold climates, you might wait to de-ice. Then you wait to take off. If that takes too long, then you go got to go back and wait to de-ice again, and then wait to take off. Once you're up in the air, you wait for the chance to buy food, in quotation marks. Um, then you wait for the chance to land sometimes, you wait for the gate ahead of you to free up, you wait to get off the plane, you wait for your luggage, you wait for a taxi. So uh, queuing theory can be really important, right? Um, let's think about what aspects of queuing theory or queuing situations would probably make the math complicated and that we'd want to start out by ignoring and which things are kind of essential and we can't start out by ignoring. So take a sec to think about all the complicated things that can happen with a queuing system and what can we ignore to just boil it down to its essence. Well, uh, time of day changes in arrival rate. It's probably easier to deal with just a single constant arrival rate and then tackle changing by time of day later. Um, some jobs have higher priorities than others, especially uh, triage in an emergency situation. Uh, some people um, give up before joining the queue if they see the queue is too long for them. So that's called balking. Some people join the queue but then end up uh, later giving up on it and leaving. That's called abandoning or reneging. Um, some people might see that the queue is long or get blocked from a system because the queue is too long and then come back later uh, so that's called retrials. There's also batch arrivals where more than one thing arrives as part of a coordinated package, like two people getting out of a car and then needing separate service. Um, there's batch service. Some things can serve more than one person at a time. Uh, maybe roller coasters are like that. Um, there's uncertainty in the arrival rate. Uh, maybe the weather depend uh, will affect the arrival rate and there's uncertainty in the weather forecast. There's different servers having different skills, like some servers might be bilingual and some servers might be monolingual. Um, and there's stuff like virtual hold, where they say, uh, we have a long wait time now, but press one and leave a message and we'll call you back within 24 business hours or something. Um, so all these things are really important to think about in the long run, but just to make life simple to begin with, we'll start by ignoring them. Let's look at some basic queuing system notation of how we describe what's going on. So we usually talk about what the arrival pattern is first, 
and then put a slash and then put something that denotes the service pattern and then put a slash and then put the number of servers. Usually arrivals would be memoryless or a Poisson process. Uh, so we would say like M for the first thing. And then the service pattern, a lot of times memoryless service durations are handy and reasonably uh, accurate to the context. So we might say M for memoryless services, which would be an exponential service duration. Um, we could say G for general uh, for any of these. We could say D for deterministic, that every single service takes exactly the same amount of time, um, which would hardly be ever exactly true, but maybe it's close enough to true that you're willing to do that. Uh, we could say E for an Erlang distribution, which is a like a gamma distribution, a surge curve. So it's kind of bell-shaped, but has a longer tail off to the right. Um, if service is more variable than exponential, you could say it's hyper-exponential. Um, or if it has something fancy and fun called a phase type distribution, which is actually kind of a continuous Markov chain, it's more general than exponential, you could use a pH there. Um, so that's so some basic examples would be MM1 would be memoryless arrivals, that's Poisson process arrivals, memoryless service, that would be exponential service durations, and one server. Um, most call center systems are MM, we can model as MMC, they have multiple servers, and maybe the talk time distribution is still reasonably close to exponential, um, so we might use that. For a lot of factory equipment, um, maybe Poisson arrivals make sense, but the processing times are maybe more regular than exponential, so we could use kind of a general service time there. Let's talk about um, what are the basic parameters, how, we how do we describe the rates that things are happening in a queuing system. Um, we're going to use mu to be a rate like lambda, like services per hour, rather than a mean service time like it might be in many statistics classes, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, so our input measures, we usually think of the arrival rate, like 120 calls per hour, we call that lambda. Uh, we think about the service rate per server, we call that mu. So we might say I have 120 calls per hour, which would be kind of two per minute or one every 30 seconds on average. If a server by themselves could handle four calls per hour, that would be about 15 minutes per call on average. Um, the number of servers, sometimes we call it C, sometimes we call it K or M or N or S, just depends on who the author of whatever paper you're reading is. And then the first uh, com slightly complicated thing here is this row. This is the Greek letter row, which looks like a, a P, but it's actually more like our English letter R for ratio rather than the Greek letter P, which is a, the Greek letter pi is actually equivalent to the English letter P. Uh, so rho is the ratio of lambda divided by mu, and that has a queuing system name of traffic. So if you have 120 calls per hour, and divide by 4 calls per hour per server, 120 divided by 4 is 30, so we would say we have 30 units of traffic. But if you look, the calls per hour on top cancels the calls per hour on the bottom, and so that 30 is technically unitless. And it's a rough approximation of how many people will be in the system on average. Uh, so if you have 120 calls per hour and the server can serve four calls per hour and you had all the servers you could ever want, no one ever had to wait, you would have an average of 30 people in the system at any one time. Then let's talk about how we're going to measure how well our queuing system is performing. So take a sec to think about what might you want to measure about a queuing system to say whether it's doing a good job keeping people happy and such. So those would be the output measures. So we might be concerned with the average number of people or jobs uh, in the system, um, and that's the people in line not getting served but just waiting, plus the people who are in service, and we'll call that L, capital L. You might consider the number of people or jobs in the queue who aren't getting served, and we'll call that L sub Q for obvious reasons. Um, you might think about what's the average time spent in the system by a job or a person. That would be time spent in the waiting line plus time spent in service, and we'll call that W. And then you might think about the average time spent in the line, not in service, and we'll call that W sub Q. And uh, if we say what's overall W, uh, total time spent in the system on average is time spent in the queue, plus the average time spent in service, which is one over mu, one over the service rate. 
So there's a simple relationship between W and WQ in most cases. Um, so our standard problems in cubing theory are knowing the arrival rate, the service rate, and the number of servers, what will the average waiting time or the average length of the line be? And there's sometimes exact formulas for that, but not always. Then the kind of bigger problem of system design, knowing how many arrivals per hour and services per hour we can do, and wanting to keep our average waiting time fairly low, how many servers do I need? That's like on the way towards staffing my system. And there's a simple approximate formula for this that we'll talk about, but there's hardly ever an exact formula. It's also interesting to think about of these output measures like L, LQ, W, W, Q, which ones are important when? So take a minute to think about in which cases would you care more about W, Q, or W? In which cases would you care more about L or care more about LQ? So think about that for a sec. So the way I usually think of it um, is for queues involving people, people get frustrated when they're in the queue, but not so much when they're in service, right? At the emergency room, you want to get to see a doctor right away, but once you're seeing the doctor, you don't want to get rushed out of the room. So you care more about WQ than W as a person. For queues involving objects, like repairing machines, um, as long as they're in our queuing system, either waiting to get repaired or getting repaired, they aren't actually processing items and making money for us. So we would tend to care more about W. The, the machine doesn't care whether it's in the queue or in service. It's just not being productive either way. We actually don't care all that often about L or LQ. We only mostly care about those in deciding how big the queuing system should be physically, like how many chairs. But you can't just plan for the average because there's a lot of variability. You need to plan um, for the average plus a few standard deviations. And the standard deviations can be reasonably large. So those are some basic output measures, L, LQ, W, and WQ. What about some fancy output measures? Well, we might want to measure the time, percent of time that a server is busy, which was called the utilization of servers. The question is, do you want that to be large or do you want that to be small? Well, think about it. I'd say it depends on your point of view. Higher utilization means your servers are busier, you're not paying them um, for time spent idle. So that's good from the manager's point of view for costs. But the higher the utilization, usually in many cases, the lower the, the higher the utilization, the longer the waiting time. So low utilization is better for to keep waiting times low and keep the customers happy. Overall, we usually don't actually try to control utilization directly, except you don't want to get it too high because if human servers are asked to work too much of the time, they will get tired and burn out. Some call centers have an over 100% turnout uh, turnover every year. That is, all the people they hire in January are gone by the next January, plus some other people that got hired along the way, which costs a lot in training. Um, so uh, we don't want to try to keep utilization high just to save money. There's other ways to think about that kind of stuff. Other things you can think about are the probability that the wait time is under some cutoff, like 20 seconds. Um, maybe keep that to 80%. Some people often quote that saying it's an 80-20 rule or something. But that really has to adapt to your context. Uh, maybe for emergency 911, you would want that probability of a short wait to be even higher. If it's a tax helpline where people usually don't need help right away, um, then maybe you'd say the wait, probability that the wait is under 20 minutes should be 80% or something. Um, you might track what's the probability that people had to wait at all. You might track percent abandonment, uh, people joining the system and then leaving because the wait was too long. Uh, you might track the probability that people get blocked if there's a finite waiting room and anyone who arrives afterwards has to go somewhere else. So next time we'll talk about one of the fundamental laws of queuing theory and talk about how we solve queues.